hearings last night and the testing this morning. From this message, we can see concerning Christ with uh, his church, there are two uh, basic aspects covered already, leaving another one which uh, we are going to cover in this uh, coming message. And the two aspects which uh, have been covered already are this. Number one, the uh, nature and life of uh, the church, which, is, which are the uh, very life, very nature of uh, Christ. Uh, from what we can see this aspect, from the type of uh, Adam and Eve, the type of Adam and Eve mainly gives us a clear view that how the church should have Christ's life and Christ's nature. Without Christ's life and nature, the church can never be the counterpart of Christ, can never be the second half to match the first half. You see, these two halves must have not only the same life, same nature, and they must have the same one life, and the same one life, one nature. This aspect is concerning the very life and nature of the church, which are Christ. And the second aspect is they are cherishing and nourishing and cherishing. <clears throat> no doubt, this is the uh, supply and the care that the church can grow. Yes, out of Christ, the church has received his life and his nature. But, you see, here the need of some care, some supply that the church can grow. Even now, uh, with if this matter of growth is implied there. Of course, last night we didn't cover. Why I say the growth of life is, is, is implied there? Look at the way God created Adam. There, it uh, doesn't uh, imply any kind of growth. God just formed a body. God formed it. There was no need of any growth. Am I right? God just formed the body in its measure of stature. And then God breathed the uh, breath of life into the nostrils. Then the man became living and a living soul, right? And then he was a complete man. Altogether, just by God's creation, not by his own growth. You see, that was completed just by God's creation. But with if it is different. If was <coughs> a rape taken out of Adam's size, then have you noticed that Genesis 2 uses the word built? Then God built, built uh, a woman with that rape. Or God built a rape into a woman. I tell you, this building into implies what? Growth. Growth. Firstly, if received the life and nature of Adam, then that something was growing. Growing into a woman. You see, the building of the rape into a woman implies the growth. So here in Ephesians, you do have uh, some indications that the growth is needed. And the indications are where? Are in the nourishing and cherishing. The nourishing and cherishing are not for imparting life to initiate something, but the nourishing and cherishing are for what? Are for uh, uh, supplying the existing life there. Right? 
this is for supplying and this is for growth, right? So cherishing, nourishing, nourishing and cherishing are not for imparting life to start something, but as uh, uh, what? Uh, supplying, right? Uh, supplying uh, that uh, the existing life may grow into its measure. So we all have to see these two aspects, right? The uh, life and nature aspect, and then the uh, nourishing and cherishing aspect. Well, we have talked, I feel, uh, sufficient, uh, sufficiently concerning these two points already, nourishing and cherishing. Yet I still like to impress you to make uh, the uh, meaning of uh, cherishing uh, more clearly. Uh, <clears throat> look at the vine tree. We have been uh, talking a lot about it, right? Look at the vine tree. Firstly, the vine tree uh, gets the uh, nourishment from the soil and from the water, right? And all these supplies get into the vine tree. So this is something inward to supply the life need. Then, what is cherishing there? See, with vine tree, what is cherishing there? I would say the cherishing of uh, the vine tree, which uh, the cherishing which the vine tree needs, is just the outward environment. Mainly the air, the sunshine, right? You know, the air or the breeze or the wind and the sunshine, they uh, regulate the atmosphere which uh, fits the growth of the vine tree. You see, when the uh, weather is too cold, then the sunshine comes to warm it up, right? When the weather is too hot, then the breeze, then the wind comes to cool it off, right? to make the atmosphere, the environment in the air so uh, fitting, right? So fitting in the growth of the vine tree. Uh, you brothers who uh, uh, are the uh, landscapers, you all know just fertilizer <laughs> to uh, uh, nourish uh, the plants is not adequate. Uh, you need the air, you need the sunshine, and the landscaping brothers talk to me a lot about the place. Uh, some kind of plants neither uh, need certain shadow, right? And some uh, kind of plants need uh, more sunshine, and some kind of plants need more uh, breeze, more air. I tell you, all these shadow, sunshine, breeze, air, wind, all these are what? Are the regulators of the uh, cherishing. So the cherishing is just outward taking care, right? And the nursing is just inward supply. So you can see Christ takes care of the church by these two ways by the inward nourishing and by the outward cherishing. And uh, when the situation is too cold, he, his presence becomes our what? Sunshine, right? When the environment is too hot, huh? like Indonesia, in the uh, right way, the sunshine is too, too hard, even too burn. So uh, Christ's presence becomes a cooling of air. Right? This is the cherishing. This is the cherishing. So nourishing within and charging without, these two things help the plants to grow. Today, with the church, it is the same. Christ is not only the source of life, is not only the source of the nature of the church, but also Christ is the regulating element for a cherishing atmosphere that we can grow properly. So inwardly, you have the nourishment, and outwardly, you have the cherishment. Now, we come to a message 
50. Christ sanctifying the church by cleansing her. This is the third aspect uh, implied in this message concerning uh, Christ and the church. The first aspect is the aspect of life and nature. And the second aspect is the aspect of nourishing, cherishing. Now the third aspect is the aspect of sanctifying by cleansing. We need to read chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Just three verses. I sure like all the time to read together. We don't have so many times to read together. Let's read. Verses 25 through 27. Husband, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water of the Lord, that he might present the church to himself, glorious, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. I would call your attention firstly that these uh, three verses are just one long sentence. Have you noticed this? Three verses are just one long sentence. And these three verses are uh, combined together by this word that twice. At the beginning of verse 26, you have that. Then at the beginning of verse 27, you have that. Let me read it to you again. These two that's combine these three verses together as a complete sentence. Husband, love your wives even as Christ. See, Christ also loved, let's read it this way, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Number one thing. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That, that, the purpose, right? Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church. For what purpose? For the purpose that he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water in the word. So, Christ loved the church and gave up for the church himself. The purpose is that he may sanctify her. And the way to sanctify her is to cleanse her by the washing of the water of the word. Sanctifying is by the cleansing. Cleansing is by the washing. And the washing is in the water. And the word is in the water. I and mean, the water is in the word. I say again, sanctifying by cleansing, and cleansing by washing, and washing by the water, and the water is in the word. Loving for the purpose to sanctify. Right? Loving. Why Christ loved the church? Why? With what purpose? With the purpose to sanctify her. So loving is for sanctifying. And sanctifying is by cleansing. And cleansing is by washing. And washing is by the water. And the water is in the word. Is this all? No. Still another that. That. He may present the church to himself. You see, 
Loving is for sanctifying, and sanctifying is for what? For presenting. He loved the church and gave up himself for the church that he may sanctify her. And he sanctifies her that he may present her to himself. Am I right? This is why you have two Zs combining the three verses into one complete sentence. And in these three verses, each has one point, right? In verse 25, the point is loving and giving. Christ loved the church and gave up himself for the church. Loving and giving, right? Loving and giving up. This is the first point. The second point is the sanctifying in verse 26. And the third point is the presenting in verse 20, 27. The first point is for the second, and the second point is for the third. I like to impress all of you with these three points consecutively, right? Okay, Christ loved the church and gave up himself for the church. Was that completed? In the good sense, it was completed but completed with a purpose. So something has to uh, continue. And the purpose is that he may sanctify this church. See? He may sanctify the church. He loved the church, and he gave up himself for the church. No doubt, that is for what? For redemption, and for also life imparting. Right? Blood and water came out of the side of Jesus. And blood there in John 19 was for redemption. And water there was for what? For life imparting. So the church came into existence. Right? You can see the church was produced in verse 25 by Christ loving her and giving himself up for her. And this is the initiation of the church. And this brings the church into existence. The church is here produced. But the bone is here, the rib is here, but it needs what? It needs some kind of a, how could a piece of rib become a pretty wife. See, you need what? You need, you need the transformation. To transform a piece of bone into a pretty wife. Right? You need transformation. And surely, I don't believe that rib was 250 pounds. Right? The most probably 8 ounces. Now, not more than one pound. Do you think one rib can weigh one pound? It's small. But then how come it became <laughs> a lady, 250 pounds? <laughs> you may say, brother, that's too much. Okay, I just give you 50% discount, how about? It still has 125 pounds. Right? And how come one rib of eight ounces eventually became 125 pounds? So no need. There was a kind of a marvelous growth. You may say that might be kind of mushrooming. I don't think so. But anyhow, the growth was marvelous. It was marvelous, right? Ah. Uh, So, listen, the production of the church is in verse 25, right? Christ loved the church, and Christ gave up himself for the church. So the church was brought forth. The church came into existence in verse 25. Then you need the sanctifying. You have to know the sanctifying here is not so simple. 
It includes the saturation. It includes the transformation. It includes the growth. It includes the building up. All these saturation, transformation, a growth, and building up, all these are all implied in this one thing, the sanctify. You see, the sanctify. The sanctification today is very, very much diminished by Christianity's definition. But here in Ephesians, I tell you, sanctification is higher, it's richer. It includes what? It includes not only the separation from the common things unto God. It includes this. It includes separation. But I tell the truth, here the major meaning is not separation. The major meaning is what? Is saturation. Saturation. To saturate the existing church with all what Christ is. Saturation. And then what? Then the transformation. Through the saturation, the church of the rib is being transformed into a bride. Right? Transformation is here. And also the growth. The growth. Right? Less than one pound in a matter, it becomes what? Under 25, the least. Maybe 225. You see? Anyhow, it, it uh, has the growth here. The growth is implied here. Not only so, the building up. The building up. So I say, by the way, don't be influenced by Christianity's definitions, teaching, and so forth. That is too, too, too far off. You see, we must go into the word and get into its depth. Then we can see. No one can deny if you get into it, you have to admit here the sanctification surely implies separation, transformation, a saturation, transformation, building up, a growth. All these things. Again, separation, saturation, uh, transformation, growth, and building up. To sanctify her by all these things, then what? Then the church becomes complete. The church becomes perfect. Then the church becomes the real and pra practical if. You know, after Eve was built up as a pretty woman, God presented Eve to whom? To Adam. The last thing to do was to present her to uh, her husband, to her source. And now the last thing to do for the church is to present us to our source, that is Christ. And the thing is good, uh, that is good is this, I tell you, uh, in presenting Eve to Adam, that was done by God. But here, Christ himself will do the presentation. He made, present the church to himself. He is the presenter as well as the receiver. Anyhow, I like to impress you, mainly I, when I say you, the young people, don't read the Bible in the right way. Don't think you understand it as you can recite no, you don't understand. Start to say that you just don't understand. Have you ever realized here the sanctifying implies what? Separation, saturation, transformation, growth, and building up. Without these few things, the church can never be perfected. Right? The church can never grow into the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. It is through all this kind of all-inclusive sanctification that the church 
is completed. The church is perfected. The church comes to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So Christ can present such a perfect church to himself. Firstly, the existence, the production of the church. Fallingly, the very sanctification to accomplish, to perfect, to complete the church. Then lastly, the presentation. Christ will present the perfected church to himself in what way? Glorious. Glorious. What does glorious mean? Fallingly, in the same verse, it gives you the definition. To be glorious is to not have any spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that she should be holy and without blemish. I tell you, this is the definition of being glorious. Even now, the uh, grammatical construction of the sentence shows you this. That he may present the church to himself glorious. What is to be glorious? That is not having spark or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. We all must be impressed that with the church there are three stages. The stage of production and the stage of building up, that is sanctification, and the stage of presentation. This morning, we all know where are we? In what stage? We are in the middle stage, right? We are in the stage of being sanctified. We are in the stage of building up, waiting for the second stage to come. That is, we will be ready to be presented by Christ to himself as the glorious church, which has no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But what? Holy, without blemish. Now we know where we are. We must spend some time this morning to take care of this all-inclusive sanctification. I like to take such a term, the all-inclusive sanctification. <coughs> What is this? What are we doing? Coming to the meeting again and again. Well, we have learned last night to uh, get the nourishment and the cherishment. Right? Hallelujah. In the meeting, we do have some inner supply. And we also have some kind of outer cherishing. Some kind of outer even either cooling down or uh, warming up, right? This is the cherishing. Why we come to the meeting? Well, we come to the meeting for nourishing and for cherishing. Well, to be nourished and cherished for, for what purpose? Say it. Yeah, for being sanctified. For being sanctified. Nourishing, cherishing, I tell you, time after time, day by day, week after week, minute by minute, year after year, <laughs> sanctify us. Nourishing, cherishing, sanctify us. Am I right? Sanctify us. I can assure you, very few among us got sanctified. 
got separated from the common things into God just by our own private time with the Lord. Most of us got what? Sanctified, separated from the world, from worldliness, from common things into God through what? Through meeting after meeting. Through meeting after meeting. In this building up stage, I tell you, brothers, we need the nourishment and we need the cherishment for what? Just for us to be separated from the world. To be separated from the world. If not, meeting after meeting, I do believe, men's after men's, I tell you, we are being separated. Separated from worldliness. And at the same time, we are being saturated. Eh? We are being saturated. Oh, nourishing. Gives us the what? Saturating. Right? We got nourished. My, what a good meeting. I got satisfied. I got satisfied. I tell you, this satisfaction by being nourished gives us what? Gives us uh, the uh, separation. Not only gives us the separation, but also gives us what? The saturation. Also we can testify when we come into meeting just to be cherished in that kind of atmosphere, I tell you, when we get back home, so many world things will be gone. Right? We will say, I don't like this thing any longer. I, I got cherished. Oh, I got cherished. I don't like these kind of things. I don't like this kind of thing. These kind of things just make me the cold bird. I just drop them, throw them away. And the church sometimes set up a burning time to burn away all these junky things. All the junky things. Right? Junky things. We burn them away because of what? Because in the meeting, we got cherished. <laughs> we just got cherished. Not only nourished, we got cherished. You see, this cherishing and nourishing not only set us apart from the world, but also saturate us with Christ. With Christ. We got saturated. Then what? Then we are transformed. We are transformed. Probably you and I, we don't realize by ourselves how much we have been transformed, but others can see. Oh, I can see so many young ones among us. My, oh, I cannot see too fast some transformation with old generations. Of course, old folks always walk slowly. Right? Even transformation, we are, we old folks are slow. Right? But the young people, you know, the young people in everything, they are quick. Even in the matter of transformation, they are quick. Yes. Why, John, you don't believe me? <laughs> see? You see, look at your son. You see, two minutes ago, he was that kind of boy. And now, Ha ha. You see, you heard the voice, praise the Lord. But that means uh, transformation happened there. Two months of time, it happens a great deal. Am I right? Transformation. Uh, you yourself don't know, but others see the change in your life, the change in the way you behave yourself. Transformation. Not just being taught, not just being corrected, not just being chastised, punished. You know, I don't believe in much, much in punishment, but I surely believe in this church nourishing, church cherishing, young people, you just come to the meeting 
I tell you, you get nourished, you get cherished just spontaneously. You are separated from the world. You will be different from all your classmates, and you'll be saturated with the riches of Christ. Then spontaneously, with you, in you, there's an amount of transformation. And also, the growing. The growing. As you are being transformed, you are growing. There's an amount of growth. I tell you, in this matter of growth, is the building up. It is by this way, I tell you, the church will be ready as that bride in Revelation 19. You know, in Revelation 19, it says, Now the wife is ready. Eve is ready. The practical Eve is ready. Now the bride is here, completed, perfected, fully grown up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now is the bread. Then what? Then the Lord Jesus will come. And he will come and present this ready bride to himself. We all must see this. So, sanctifying here is a strong word. Now, let us see. By what way the Lord is sanctifying us? I tell you, he sits here by cleansing. It is nourishing and it is cherishing. But actually, all issue in what? In cleansing. You know why? With Eve, there was no need of cleansing. Right? Eve never got fallen. Eve never got a lot of negative things loaded upon her. Right? Eve was a piece of pure bone, clean, pure, single, no mixture, right? That piece of bone, that piece of rib was pure, no mixture. So with Eve, there was no cleansing, right? No cleansing, but cleansing is needed with us. Why? Because we got fallen. We got loaded. Right? We got uh, contaminated with too, too many dirty things. Right? Maya, you need a list to tell us all these dirty things within us and upon us that need to be cleansed away. The natural life, the self, Right? The old man, the flesh, the lust, right? And plus this also the spot and the wrinkle. All these things need to be cleansed away. The uh, very strange thing to me is that here, of course, in this chapter, you have nourishing already. You have cherishing already. No doubt, nourishing, cherishing are for supplying, right? Are for, for, uh, for what? For a kind of a, uh, care, right? You have this already. But don't forget, just nourishing, cherishing without cleansing. Aha. Uh -huh. Our problems would still remain. Our problems. Today, the Lord nourishing and cherishing are going along with his cleansing. With his cleansing. The medical doctors would tell us, you know what? with our eating, with our drinking, there is all the time the cleansing. You see? 
if this world is clean, and if our being is clean without any germs, without any negative things, right? We don't need the cleansing. But we all know today too, too many different kind of germs, right? So, hallelujah. In the food, in the water, there are some elements which can uh, constitute a kind of antab antibal <laughs> antibiotic to kill the germs. You see? And uh, we all know this metabolic work, metabolism within us always carries away all these discharges, right? Carries away so many dead bodies, yeah? so many dead things. This is cleansing. You see, this is cleansing because we are in a world with a being, in a in dirty world with a dirty being. So we need not only the nourishing, the cherishing, but also the cleansing. We all have to see this. We are uh, uh, used to take a shower, right? That is to wash away the outward uh, things, right? But do you, you know, sure I do know you know, that there is a kind of cleansing it's going on all the time, all the time. So all the dirty things will be charged away. Otherwise, we could never be healthy. We could never be strong. You have to realize by coming to the meeting, time after time, we get the nourishment, we get the nourishing, we get the cherishing. Eventually, these two things, nourishing, cherishing, do some work within us. Not just to nourish us, not just to cherish us, but also to what? Cleanse us. Cleanse us. Spontaneously to you, even unconsciously. I tell you, a cleansing is going on with us. As long as we come to meeting, to pick up the nourishing and to get the cherishing, a kind of cleansing is going on within us. It is this cleansing that uh, forms a kind of metabolism. The uh, metabolism in the church life is mainly uh, brought forth by this cleansing. You may say, well, brother, uh, let's turn to the other way. The cleansing carries out by the uh, metabolism. You may say either. But to me, I am more than practical. I tell you, no cleansing, no metabolism. And uh, the cleansing comes from what? From nursing, cherishing. From nursing, cherishing. This the cleansing. You believe me, and you check with the medical doctors, suppose seven or eight days you don't eat. I tell you, cleansing stops. The cleansing stops because there's no element, you see, to uh, carry out the cleansing. You need to take food. You need to take water. You need to eat a drink. Then you have all these elements getting into you and these elements will do a work. You see, what work? That is to cleanse you. That is to carry away all the dead bodies, dead cells, dead things within you. Then, I tell you, you have the uh, what? Metabolism. Today, it is absolutely so with the church life. So, without our physical body, I don't think we can understand Ephesians 5 so well. By the physical body, we can understand what it talks about here, why we need the nourishing, why we need the cherishing, then the uh, cleansing. I tell you, the actual cleansing is 
the sanctified. You have to see, grammatically speaking, here you don't have the uh, conjunction and, uh, uh, sanctifying and cleansing, right? Not sanctifying and cleansing, but sanctifying, comma, cleansing. So cleansing is the sanctifying. The sanctifying is the cleansing. Cleansing by what? Cleansing by the washing. I, uh, when I was young, reading this verse, I just thought Paul was not a good writer. It's too uh, uh, repetitious. Isn't washing cleansing? Isn't cleansing washing? What the difference between washing and cleansing? Cleansing by washing. Out of the water, it's too awkward. Why Paul wouldn't say cleansing by the water in the word? Don't you think my composition is much better? No, cleansing by the water in the word. Here Paul says cleansing by the wa washing of the water in the word. If you look into so many translations, you could see they all got to bother. They all got to bother. They have different ways to interpret what Paul meant. But I believe our rendering is the most literal one, literal one, and the most correct one. Oh. Actually, the word washing here is the word in Greek that means labor. If you go to the Septuagint, Septuagint old husband, that was in Greek, right? In Exodus, you have the uh, labor there. That was written in Hebrew. But when it was translated in Greek, in the Septuagint translation, the word there was translated labor. I didn't have the time to talk to John and all. I didn't have the time. We were too much in hurry, you know. Actually, I prefer to translate the word washing here into labor. Cleansing by the labor of the water. Now you are clear. You see? By the labor of the water. And this indicates what? This indicates, I tell you, in a good sense, the word of God is the labor. The Bible is the labor. You know where was the labor put? The labor was put right after the altar and in front of the tabernacle. You see, any priest coming to serve God, they have to uh, go to the altar first to get their sin dealt with by the blood, right? After that, uh, kind of a, a redeeming, uh, then they go forth to the labor. Uh, to get the hand, their foot, uh, their feet washed, to get uh, all the dirt by their earthly contact to be washed away in the labor. I do believe Paul's concept really meant the labor. Cleansing her by the labor of the word. By the labor of the word. In the universe, the actual labor is the Bible. The actual labor is God's word. God's word is the labor. Cleanse her by the labor of the word. Hallelujah. We do have an actual labor. You see? And those priests, they had a type. They had a type, a labor, a physical labor made with brass. They, don't, they didn't have the actual labor, but today we have. And the actual labor we have today is the word, is the word. I tell you, brothers, even the sequence in experience really corresponds with ancient time. You know, in ancient time, 
the serving ones coming to serve God, firstly, they came to the altar. Then they passed on to the liver. You know, today, we firstly come to the cross. That's our altar. There, on the cross, there, at the cross, we got saved. We got redeemed. Right? We got justified. Then, after the cross, where do we go? We go to the Bible. Where do we come? We come to the Word. The Word is the labor. Hallelujah. Oh, at the, at the altar, blood was there. But in the labor, water is here. I tell you, at the cross, we see the redeeming blood. We got redeemed, we got saved, we got justified, we got reconciled to God. Now we are going on. Where do we go? To the Word. To the labor. To the Bible. The Bible is the labor. This is why you read the Old Testament. <clears throat> I tell you, no priest is, was allowed to go on if they pass by the labor. Uh, if they don't come to labor, I tell you, they could never enter into the holy, holy place. This is why day after day, every day, every morning, every evening, we have to come to labor. I cannot tell you how many times I wash my hands. <laughs> I do believe more than 15 times. I like to check you how many times you wash your hands. <laughs> right? In our restaurant, we don't have a basin here. A washing basin. We have to wash. We have to wash. I tell you, this is the word. We must have the word as our labor, as our vision. Watch. I tell you, after a little talk, uh -huh, with your wife even, you have to come back to wash. <laughs> come to the word to get you washed. Right? You go to the bank to count the money. The money is the most dirty thing. And you come back from the, the bank, you go to where? To the basin. And wash your hand. You go to contact the world for half a day. At the noon time, at the lunch break, come to the river. Wash. Wash yourself. Right? And wash away all the dirt. You have to come to the river of the word again and again cleansing her by the labor of the word. <clears throat> uh, no, uh, sorry. The labor of the water. Now, where is the labor of the water? Uh, where is the water? The word, the water is in the word. So you may call this labor the labor of the water or the labor of the word. Is the same. In the word, there is the water. And this water, I tell you, is just like the water in the labor. I do believe we all have realized that in the Bible, there is the water. But here, listen, here, it doesn't mean the uh, quenching water. It doesn't mean the water that quenches our thirst. You know, mostly we understand the water in the world, the quenching water, right? But not too many that realize the water in the, in the world is not only quenching, but also washing. Also washing. While it quenches you, it washes you. The quenching water is also the washing water. And here Paul doesn't care for your thirst. Here Paul cares for your what? For your dirt. Your dirt. You have too many negative things. These things should be removed. These things should be washed away. So Paul here cares for the dirt. 
So he cares for the washing water, not the quenching water. In the Bible, the word, I tell you, is a kind of a water that washes away. You know, so many years ago, I uh, read a manuscript of Brother Nee's message concerning reading the Bible. I mentioned this to some of uh, the churches in some places, but for some of you young ones, I'd like to repeat it. While Brother Nee was speaking on reading the Bible, a sister asked such a question. Brother Nee, I have a bad memory. I read, I forget. I read, I forget. I can never remember anything I read. What, Brother Nee? Then do I need to read the Bible any longer? I read, I forget. There's no need for me to read. Brother Nee was good. Right away, he said, that was in China. You know, he said, all the ladies wash the rice, R I C, rice, for making food. They uh, wash their uh, rice in a uh, basket. Uh, made with willows. And they put the rice in the basket and they put the basket into uh, the river or into uh, a pond. They just pull the basket into the pond and pour it up and into the pond and pour it up into the water and pour it up into the water and pour it up. But then he says, ah, uh, uh, this may be put in the water more than 10 times, and when it is pulled up, every, every bit of water goes. This means you read the Bible, the Bible goes. You read the Bible, the Bible goes. Every bit of the Bible goes. But, but the news said, look at the good thing is this. <laughs> Both the basket and the rice are washed. The basket, just like you, may ask, I cannot retain any water. Why do you need to put me into the water? So stop putting me into the water. No. Stop putting you in the water. You'll be dirt. You'll be dirty. Right? And this putting you into the water again and again and again, even though no water remains, yet you get washed. You get cleansed, my goodness. When I read that, I was deeply impressed. Really so. You just come to the Word. In the morning, lunch time, evening time, before bed. I tell you, you just read two or ten verses. Uh -huh. you, you, you get what? Washed. Put your basket into the water. Again and again and again. There is the water in the word that washes. And this is the labor, the actual labor we have today. Now, what shall I do? You have to notice in Ephesians 5, mainly, the washing well, is not to wash away your sins. The washing is mainly to wash away the spot and the wrinkles. I surely now have a good face to illustrate this. If you look at me, I have a lot of wrinkles here. Wrinkles, right? Brother, come up. You look at uh, his brow. No wrinkle. <laughs> look at my brow. Full of wrinkles. This is due to what? Oldness. Look at him. There's no wrinkle. Why? Because he's still young, fresh. These folk, 
It's too old. You don't have the sign of oldness. What is this? Wrinkles. Wrinkles. Thank you, brother. Then, sorry to expose myself so much to you. Look at my face. I have a spot here. Hurt by something. And I have some moles here. I forgot this side or this side. I just forgot. I don't remember well my, myself so well. You can see this side, some moles or this side. But anyhow, some moles here. I tell you, this hurt, scar, and mole, all these are spots. These are not sins. So spot is something natural. Wrinkle is something of oldness. The church, no need to say to be many years, see the church in hand. It has been here close to five years. I tell you, it has picked up a lot of oldness, a lot of wrinkles here. So all these wrinkles have to be washed away by what? By the inner cleansing of the water in the word. The more we come to the word, the more we get the nourishment. I tell you, the nourishment renders a kind of inner cleansing. Am I right? This kind of defects, spots of the natural life and wrinkles of the old age could never be washed by something that is not organic. We need a kind of organic washing, metabolically, to carry away all our natural defects and all the signs of our oldness. Right? The church without blemish. All the mixtures, all the natural defects, wash it away, and uh, all the signs of oldness wash away. And this kind of washing is all together by life and by life nourishment. This is why we have to be nourished. We have to abide in Christ at the very source of our nourishment and we have to contact to receive the word that we may get the nourishment within the nourishment there is the organic washing to uh, wash us metabolically from all kind of natural defects all kind of uh, oldness this is the way to have the church perfected to make the church glorious See, I think now we must stop. Uh, next message will be nearly a kind of continuation of this. So, anyhow, I would ask this section. No, this section. Okay, this section to uh, take care of the sharing. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministry.